This is Living Waters of Grace, the teaching ministry of Lewis Harrell, assistant pastor of Calvary Chapel of Westmoreland County in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Now here's Pastor Lewis as he continues teaching through God's Word. David escaped twice, which tells me that Saul tried to do this twice. And David was able to escape. Now, Saul was a warrior, but so was David. But so was David. Had not been for the spirit that David had, that could have been a serious confrontation. But David didn't. And the Bible says that David behaved himself wisely. He behaved himself wisely. In other words, he didn't throw back the spear. You must have read in the Bible that David was a daring and brave man. However, when Saul tried to kill him twice with his spear, David never retaliated to exact revenge on Saul, even though he was more than capable of doing so. How do you believe he did it? Today, Pastor Lewis points out why self-control is vital. Satan can put you in situations where you may consider reacting in a way that is unacceptable in God's eyes. Instead of acting on instinct, you can allow God to take charge of the situation. Now here's Pastor Lewis in 1 Peter chapter 3 with today's edition of Living Waters of Grace. Why don't we turn in our Bibles to, um, let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 3. We left off last time at verse 11. Before we do that, I do want to go back just a chapter and take a look at something that we talked about just to tie some things together as we move forward, as Peter makes this shift from talking about submission in the home and in the family and in the workplace and all those places. And then he gives a message to the church body as a whole. And as we go forth, he makes some very, very interesting comparisons uh, to Old Testament stories. So back in chapter 2, There was something very interesting that um, Peter begins to speak about, and I just want to kind of go back over that. In chapter 2, he begins here in verse 9, and he says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. And then he mentions why you were called. What is it that we're called to do? as his special people, as a holy nation, as a chosen generation. What are we set apart to do? And he says that you may proclaim the praises of him who have called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Proclaim the praises of him who have called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light light. There's a lot of ways that we can offer praise to God. When we join in together corporately, we praise and we worship God. We worship him whenever we're in obedience to God. We worship him and we praise him. We lift up his name. There's a lot of ways that we can lift up the name of God. But as we go forth, as Peter goes forth and he talks about ways that we offer praise to God. It's ways that we are set apart and are seen as different from the world. And our our calling gives praise to God. It lifts up the name of Jesus. And in this, he talks about the submission. That is ways that we do it. Living before the world, that is ways that we lift up the name of Jesus. Our submission to government and to our employers and and the way that wives submit to husbands and the way that husbands interact with the wife, these are all ways that we are called to give praise to God. It's all ways that we look different. We are set apart from the world. And then when we get down to uh, chapter 3, verse 8, we talked about it. He talks to the church Combine, And he says, finally, in the way of summing it all up, let's sum it all up. Finally, 
Be of one mind, be harmonious. And then he mentions those five things, being harmonious and to be compassionate and to, and to love as brothers and to be tenderhearted and to be courteous towards one another and not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling or insult for insult. But on the contrary, because you are people of God, because you are a chosen generation, because you are a royal priesthood, you don't do those things. You don't return the evil for evil, and you don't return reviling for reviling, but you do the opposite. You do the contrary of that, which is you offer blessing. We're called to be a blessing, not only to each other, but to be a blessing to those who are outside as well, because for most of the people who are outside of the church, most of the people who are not believers, we may be the only example that they see of God's word. The only example that they see of holiness, the only example that they see of obedience to God and how we are different. So then, as he goes into verse 10, He starts to make this comparison, or he actually quotes Psalm 34, verses 12 through 16. And this is a Psalm of David. And he quotes this Psalm. Now, what's interesting about it is that David was, too, a man who was being persecuted. David was a man who was running for his life from Saul. Running for his life from Saul. Did not do anything to Saul, but he was running for his life from Saul. He was being persecuted. And he says here in verse 10, he says, for he who would love life and see good days, those good days that he was talking about, he's talking about the days that we have even now, even regardless of what's going on in our lives, when we are in obedience to the Lord, we will love life and see good days. We love our life in Jesus Christ, and we definitely love the life that is to come. And he gives us some instruction here. He said, first of all, watch what you say. Let him reframe his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Watch what you say. Evil can take place in a lot of different ways. And one of the main ways that evil takes place in the things that we say. And Peter is saying, be careful. Just like David was saying, be careful what you say. Don't let your tongue condemn you. And let his lips from speaking guile. And then he goes to verse 11. And that's where we're going to pick it up this morning here in verse 11. And he says, in verse 11, he says, let him turn away from evil and do good. Very interesting when he talks about turning away from evil and doing good. Psalm 37, 27 says, depart from iniquity and do good and forever dwell. In 2 2 Timothy 2 and 19, he says, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal that the Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Well, what are you talking about, Peter? Depart from iniquity. What are you saying? You, you, you're you talking about your lips. You're talking about uh, you know, using your tongue in ways that can hurt people, but then you say turn from iniquity or turn from sin and turn from evil and do good. What do you mean by that? Because Peter understood the same thing that David understands is that when people slander you, When people speak ill of you, when people lie on you, when people try to damage you, your reputation with their tongue, it's a natural thing in us to want to gird up, find a way. What can I say about this person to get even? What can I say about this person to bring them back down? What can I say about this person to show them up? We begin to think evil in our own hearts. I'm going to get you back. You can't say that about me. You can't lie on me. There's one thing I don't deal with is people lying on me. I'm going to get you back. You think what you said was bad. You wait till you hear what I got to say. Oh, we show people up with our tongues. And Peter said, no, 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 no. Depart from that. Don't do that. Turn away from that. There's a scripture that says, there's a psalm that says that I thought on my ways and I turned my feet toward your testimony. 
sometimes we just have to think on what it is that we're doing. Allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts and to show us that look what you're doing is evil. You got to turn from that. And if we're quiet, if we're slow to speak, and if we're quick to hear, and if we're slow to wrath, that can happen. The Holy Spirit will speak to us and will say, you don't need to say that. You don't need to do that. What was interesting in this story with David, and I want to go back to it if we can. Interesting in this story. One of the things that happened with David is that he got into a battle. I'm sorry, it wasn't a battle. It was actually him being nice to Saul. He was, trying, he was doing exactly what the word says. Do good to others. And Saul had this evil spirit that he had. And whenever this evil spirit would come on Saul, the only thing that would subside this evil spirit is when David would play music. Gentle music, the spiritual music that that David would play would actually head off this evil spirit. Music is powerful. Me and Pastor Clark was talking the other day. We like to go back every now and then and talk about some of the old songs that we used to listen to, you know, like the Earth, Wind, and Fire songs or some of the old Motown songs, you know. Not the songs that people were talking about, you know, about killing and beating and, and all these crazy things and swearing. We're talking about a song that a whole family could sit down and listen to. And we just go back and we talk about some of those songs sometimes. But, but, I, but we were talking about, we mentioned the kind of mood that it put you in. It didn't put you in the mood to go out and want to kill somebody. It didn't put you in the mood to want to go out and rape somebody, want to go out and beat up somebody, or go out and steal, or a calm mood. And this is what David's music was doing for Saul. It would avert that evil spirit. But then on this one particular day, after Saul got jealous and his eye got evil, David was playing this music before Saul, and Saul picked up a spear. A spear. Now, Saul was from the the tribe of Benjamin. They were good with weapons. They were very good with weapons. But he threw this spear, and it missed David, went into the wall, and the Bible says that David escaped twice, which tells me that Saul tried to do this twice, and David was able to escape. Now, Saul was a warrior, but so was David. But so was David. Had not been for the spirit that David had, That could have been a serious confrontation, but David didn't. And the Bible says that David behaved himself wisely. He behaved himself wisely. In other words, he didn't throw back the spear. And to me, that tells me that when people do evil, when people try to hurt us, when people slander us, when people talk about us, when people try to do things to destroy us, let's not throw back the spear. Let's not throw back the spear. So he, he's, he, 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 he's talking about the fact that you escape. You got you to depart from iniquity. You know, the one thing that's interesting in the scriptures when it comes to how we should respond, a Christian, as Christians, our reaction to others is never based on what they do to us or what they say about us. It's never based on that, but it's always based on our obedience to God and his word. My reaction to what you do should never be based on what you did to me. That's the world. That's what I used to be. That's why you're here in the world. Look, I treat people the way they treat me. That's not a godly. That's not a biblical statement. That's not a godly attitude. That's a worldly attitude. I treat people the way they treat me. No, God doesn't call us to do that. In fact, as he said here, he said, on the contrary, (laughs) On the contrary, when people we are to be a blessing, when people are enemies to us, God said, love them. When people curse us, God said, bless them. When people try to hurt us, God said, pray for them. That's what he said. It's totally opposite. So don't throw back the spear. And Jesus is our example. Chapter 2, verse 23 who when he was reviled, and speaking of Jesus, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to him who judges righteously. He didn't throw, he don't throw back the spear. He committed himself to God. 
and he became, he continued to be obedient to God. And then the next thing he says here, the bottom of verse 11, he says, let him seek peace and pursue it. Now, I had to read that a couple times because, see, you know, sometimes we can look to get ourselves off the hook. We know that we don't have peace with somebody, and we figure, well, if I'm not doing nothing to him, then I want to have peace with him, but hey, he's not, or she's not having peace with me, so, I, you know, look, I'm just going to leave them alone, and that'll be it. No, the Bible doesn't say just be at peace with people. The Bible says seek it. Seek peace and pursue it. Wait a minute. Not. And I know that there's an issue I have to seek the peace. That means I have to intentionally go and make peace or attempt to make peace with that person. Whoa. Whoa. Because see, that's where the pride gets in. I didn't do nothing wrong, so why should I say anything? I didn't do nothing wrong. I didn't do nothing to hurt that person. I didn't say nothing to him. I didn't bother him at all. Bob didn't say that. There's an issue. And you know there's an issue. Seek peace and pursue it. Be intentional about making peace. And I find that to be somewhat difficult in the way that we are, but that's the DNA that lets us know that we are children of God. Matthew 5 and 9, what does it say to us? Blessed are that's how makers, God, that God is our friend of God. They're the children of God. That's how we know that we belong to God, that God is our father and not Satan. Peacemakers. The fruits of righteousness are sown in peace. Also tell us over in Hebrews 12 and 14, he says that you should follow after peace. Follow after peace. Seek it, pursue it, follow after it. Follow after peace and righteousness, because without that, no one will see the Lord. No one will see the Lord. And we know that Jesus Christ is peace. Isaiah 9 and 6, Jesus Christ is the prince of peace. And in Ephesians 2 and 14, Jesus Christ is our peace. So our peace, we can't have peace, first of all, without Jesus Christ. That's the only true peace we can have. He is the Prince of Peace, and he is our peace. But let me also mention this, that this peace that we have, it must be on the basis of righteousness and not peace at all costs. Because sometimes people will try to get you to be at peace only if you compromise and do what they want you to do. And I think sometimes about relatives who are involved in sin. And they don't want to be bothered with you as long as you're standing against that sin. But if you compromise that sin, then they're okay with being peaceful with you, being in relationship with you, having contact with you, if you're willing to compromise. I friend, out a parent who may have a young child who wants to live with her boyfriend or girlfriend. And if you don't want to accept that, then now they don't want to speak to you no more. Or if they have children, you know, if they have children and because you're not in agreement with their lifestyle because it's contrary to the word of God, well, then you can't see your grandchildren no more because, hey, no, sorry, you got to compromise. Bibles never tell us to do that. We're not going to compromise. And that's why, you know, even Paul said himself in Romans 12, 18, if it is possible as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men, if it is possible. So what does that mean? That means, look, first of all, let me make sure that my side of the yard is clean. Let me make sure that I've done or I'm doing everything I need to do to try to pursue peace. And if I've done that, and if my conscience is clear before the Lord that I'm not holding anything back with trying to pursue peace, if my conscience is clear on that, then I have to allow this person to have the birth that they need because it's not always possible to have peace with everybody. And he understands that. David tried to have peace with Saul. He pursued Saul. 
to try to have peace with. Many times he had an opportunity to take Saul out and he asked him, Saul, what have I done? What have I done, Saul? And Saul was never able to give him an answer because David was clean. He never really did anything. But yet, Saul did not want to have peace. There was nothing David could do about that. But he behaved himself wisely because he never spoke ill of Saul and wouldn't allow anybody else to do it. He never attacked Saul and wouldn't allow anyone else to do it. He behaved himself wisely. He allowed, he trusted in God and allowed God to take care of it. And that's the message that we have today. We have to trust in God and allow God to handle those situations where it may be when we're trying to have peace with someone, we are pursuing it. We're doing all that we can on our end to have peace with someone, but it's just not happening. And short of compromising, peace is not going to happen. Well, then at that point, you got to turn over to the Lord. We turn over to the Lord. So then we go to verse 12, and it says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. We know that, you know, it's interesting that he uses the word eyes and ears because we know that God is a spirit, you know, and, and a spirit, you know, I mean, the eyes and the ears, those things are just to let us know that these are attributes that God can have. He can see things and he can still hear things because he is God. He's not an idol. And the first point I just want to make about that is the fact that I am so glad that we serve a true and living God. We don't serve an idol. We don't serve something that, I, that we create with our own hands and we give them ears, but they can't hear. We give them a mouth, but they can't speak. We give them hands, but they can't feel. We give them feet, but they can't move. And the best example of that was when Elijah went against the 450 prophets of Baal. Oh, here, let's go on a... Now, let's see whose God is real here. Let's see whose God is real here. Let's go on up to Mount Carmel. You bring all your boys, and all I'm bringing with me is the Lord. And we're going up on the mountain, and we're going to see whose God is God. And that's exactly what he did. He allowed them to call on Baal from, the Bible says, all day, all night. They called on Baal. They yelled. They cut themselves. They did everything they could, calling on Baal. But Baal couldn't answer. Because he's not a true God. He's not God. So he couldn't hear their calls. And, if, and he, couldn't, he couldn't answer them because regardless of the fact that they created things that he has ears, he couldn't hear. Regardless of the, uh, the idols that they created that had a mouth, he couldn't speak. It doesn't matter that they gave him wings. He can't fly. But then Elijah said, let me call on my God, the true and living God. And he did, and we know the rest of them. He called on his God, and his God heard, and he answered, and he delivered, because that's just who God is. Second Chronicles 16 and 9 says, The eyes of the Lord runs to and fro over the whole earth to show himself strong on those whose hearts are loyal to him. And then we look at the fact that not only does God hear but he answers the prayers of those who fear him. God answers those prayers. I like Psalm 145. I just want to read that real quick because I think that was a blessing. Psalm 145, verse 19, he says, He will fulfill the desires of those who fear him, who also will hear their cry and save them. Psalm 145 and 19. What a blessing. In a world and a nation that's perpetually divided, a year like this one is no stranger to division within the church as well. In today's message, Pastor Lewis touched on themes in First and Second Peter where the author knew that there was a tendency to divide about things that were not as important as the gospel message. He urged new believers to stay grounded and rooted in the word and to what was true and knowledgeable. This takes a level of spiritual maturity that you have to be all in in order to do. Maybe something you heard today has sparked something within you, convicting you, inspiring you, just even a friendly reminder of what God's called you to. 
Don't lose sight of the most important thing in following Jesus, being an example of Christ, and encouraging others to enter into that. If you're unsure what some of this even means, we'd like to refer you to our website, calvarychapelonline.com. There you'll find an About tab that will walk you through what we as a church believe to be true from Scripture. If you have further questions, feel free to fill out a contact form by going to the Contact Us tab and clicking on the link. You can even fill out a prayer request form too. It's so helpful for us to know where our listeners are at in their spiritual walk with God. Peter was a great example of someone who was devoted to following Jesus, but he had his moments where his faith faltered like all of us. Peter's example should give you hope that there's redemption and restoration of relationship with Jesus, even if you mess up. You'll be looking forward to the next edition here in 1st and 2nd Peter, so join us again on Living Waters of Grace.